Thank you very much. And I would like to start by thanking Jacob for his entertaining, insightful, and very stimulating uh, lecture, which I think reflected quite well his wealth of experience in the central banking world, but also way beyond our little world. And it perfectly prepared the ground for our panel discussion. Your reflections, Jacob, on uh, central banking gave us a profound summary of how the central banks responded to the crisis, what could be called the pre-crisis consensus, and what questions need to be answered in terms of the future role of central banks. So what is central banking about? Until the great financial crisis, the answer to this question seemed pretty straightforward. The central bank's task is to maintain price stability, and it should perform this task by adjusting the level of a short-term policy rate. But as you rightly pointed out, the experience of the crisis and its aftermath have raised very fundamental questions about the remit of central banking, about its goals, and about its boundaries. And I do agree with Jacob that the crisis has not downgraded the importance of the price stability objective, nor has the crisis disproven the benefits of central bank independence. Nevertheless, it needs to be taken into account that central bank independence is no longer considered sacrosanct, and even in countries with a long-standing tradition of central bank independence, arguments against independence have been put forward. Some of the crisis measures have given rise to public and academic debates on the legitimacy and democratic control of central banks, because on the one hand, a narrow interpretation of our mandate appears to offer some protection in this debate and to fend off the risk of being overburdened, as Jacob has highlighted. But on the other hand, it seems to be undisputed that central banks do have a responsibility for financial stability. Indeed, many central banks have been given financial stability mandates alongside their price stability mandate as a consequence of the crisis. However, the crucial question, and there's no consensus in this regard, is whether or not monetary policy should have a role with regard to financial stability, that is by leaning against growing financial imbalances, or whether or not financial stability should be left solely to macroprudential policy. That being said, I hope that we can expand on some of the themes Jacob has raised in our panel discussion. And I'm very grateful to Augustin Carstens, François Villeroy de Gallo, and Raghu Rajan for agreeing to be on our panel. I will ask each of them to speak for about 10 minutes. And then before opening the floor uh, for a general discussion, I will ask Jacob if he has some comments on the panelists. Uh, and then we can move on with the Q&A session. So let me give the floor to our first speaker, which is Augustine. Augustine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. And uh, uh, thank you, Jacob, for, for a, a great uh, presentation, great lecture. Uh, something that many of you probably do not know is that Jacob was my, my, my professor. Uh, I met him in 1983 at the University of Chicago. And I can assure you that nobody slept in his lectures. <laughs> he kept us uh, very, very engaged, uh, not so much entertained because he was very serious and at the University of Chicago, but he kept us, he kept, he kept us uh, very, very engaged. Um, I mean, I think he, he really gave a tour de force about the uh, central banking and uh, uh, obviously I share his, his main message. Uh, Back to basics, uh, uh, obviously uh, we have to be aware of the limited capacities of the central bank uh, to have uh, mostly the, ob the objective of, of price stability. Uh, certainly I, I concur with the, the way he expressed uh, uh, or he na narrated the evolution of central banking into inflation targeting. So I basically will, will, will just uh, make some comments uh, that in a way follow uh, uh, pretty much uh, the argumentative line of, of Jacob. And, and, and certainly I would like to refer more to, to the global financial crisis, that, uh, at least from my point of view, we are still uh, digesting it. I think one major issue, and probably there you could have added a little bit more dramatism to, to your nar narrative, is that uh, there really was an explosion in, in, in the complexity, interconnectedness, and so on of the financial markets. 
I think it uh, really, uh, once a crisis erupted, it really surprised us the complexity and how, just how chaotic in a way uh, the financial markets uh, developed. And in a way, wh wh what big disparity was between our capacity to regulate and supervise. Uh, and I think that that, that was probably a, a very important lesson that we, uh, that we needed uh, to, to, to we need to learn. I think using uh, some of your, your uh, analogies, I mean, it's, it's like we were expecting the crisis to come from this direction, but it really came from behind us. And it took us, it really hit us. And of course, once you're hit with the crisis, uh, uh, it's very, very difficult to know what to do. I mean, I think one of, of, of what, something that people do not realize is that when you enter into a crisis, and most of the time the crisis is unexpected, uh, it's like flying an airplane without instruments. Because the typical relationships that hold you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and that you are sort of used to, 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 to basically depend on them to conduct your business, no more, no, 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 no more holds. Therefore, you have to start a pretty much, a, a pretty, pretty, pretty much a, a, a responding a, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, 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 basically uh, trying to innovate as new events happen uh, every, every day. And uh, now these modern crises, as the global financial crisis, they are so complex that, uh, 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 that certainly we need to revise the toolbox that we have because I don't think that the, uh, the, 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 we have a sufficient toolbox. We have, we, we have been facing a situation where we basically needed to improvise because it was a systemic breakdown. And uh, in some of that, that, that uh, uh, basically improvisation, certain things uh, uh, work well. I think the thrust of the measures were adequate, uh, but certainly uh, it, it will be very useful to do a recap once time passes and, 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 and uh, extract some lessons uh, so that we can refine our, our toolbox. I would say that given the severity of the glo global financial crisis, something that was of the essence is to have a quick response. And, 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 and one of the reasons that, that I explained that the central banks have become so, so present in the crisis resolution is that uh, central banks are like the emergency room, no? I, especially when it's a financial crisis. Uh, they bring the person that was hit <laughs> to the emergency room, and uh, you basically try to, to stabilize him, to make sure that he will live, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that's what we central banks uh, did. Uh, I think a little bit where the problem really is and, and the one we face today is that, n that not only they want, I mean, in, in some societies or in, some, in, in the way things have happened, not only they want the central bank to keep the person alive and to stabilize it, but also to teach them again how to walk, how to run, uh, how to, to, to play music, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, too many mandates, I would say, to, or too high of, of requests uh, or, or, or too high expectations have been placed on central banks. Uh, I fully agree with you that what the monetary policy does uh, in, ter in, in crisis situations is precisely to provide time, to buy time for other measures to kick in, no? and so that the final objective, to, that, which is to have a sustainable growth with low inflation, is, 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 is the result that, that, that you, you obtain. Uh, uh, but I think that, that, that uh, regretfully, uh, for many different reasons in different places, 
this time has not been used appropriately. Uh, we have to be mindful that monetary policy cannot uh, eliminate rigidities, nor it can flexibilize markets. It cannot directly engineer productivity growth. Uh, neither can generate the capacity for debts to be paid of households or corporations. I mean, other policies need to be implemented, and uh, that is what bring, will bring, uh, will bring, uh, uh, I would say, the ultimate objective that we all that we all want. Uh, central banks have limited instruments; uh, they can affect short-term rates, influence inflationary expectations influence exchange rate, affect duration in the, in, the, in, the, in the financial markets. They have some channels uh, of transmission that sometimes are difficult to predict. Uh, but that gives you, that gives you also a, a limited impact in the overall, in the overall economy. Uh, so I think that is, it is necessary, as you say, to go back to basics. And, and what is the, the basics in this case? Well, it's to remember that, that, that the policy mix is really important. And the policy mix is not only comprised of fiscal policy, uh, but also monetary policy, which uh, uh, now, in, I would say, in, 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 in its uh, new reincarnation, I, I think that it certainly has to include not only price stability, but at least to keep an eye on financial stability. I don't think also that the central bank can guarantee financial stability per se. I mean, financial stability depends also on what many other players in the economy do. But you know, now we need to have, in my analogy, 360 degrees view. I mean, we need to, to, to see also what is coming behind us uh, so that we're not surprised in that, in that way. And, and if we detect something to raise our voice, uh, uh, certainly, uh, major changes need to be made, and they are in the progress of being made of, uh, in, in the field of financial regulation and supervision, which I think also was a major problem in terms of identifying, in, in terms of uh, identifying uh, 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 the crisis. And I think there we have worked a lot. But again, this is something where uh, we need to do it on a continuous basis. I, I, I think it would be a mistake to sort of think that uh, we did this big push to have Basel III and other reforms, and then we can sort of uh, sit down and rest and say we're done with financial stability. Probably we, we, we will say, and we should say, we are done with, uh, at least for some time, with the regulatory changes that need to be in place because we need to give regulatory certainty. But, some, but the surveillance of financial markets and to keep up to speed with innovation and with the risks that are being created should be a, a constant job that we need to, to undertake. And then the issue of structural reforms are, are, are also very, very important. Uh, another, another very important, uh, I would say, policy, uh, policy instruments that we need, and that's precisely to take care of the spillovers that, that you mentioned, is macro, macro prudential policies. Uh, it's a new field. Uh, we have already had some uh, experiences. Uh, we have already learned some lessons. Uh, but I think that uh, we need to learn more and more and more. And also, I think that, that, that uh, uh, I fully agree with you about uh, the fact that uh, sometimes a lot is being talked about cooperation and coordination, and uh, 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 probably more can be done in that field, uh, uh, but also probably an effort for some of the advanced economies to incorporate at least some of the externalities uh, would be would be desirable. Although uh, I think it's extremely difficult, and I share the views at least that, uh, for example, Ben Bernanke uh, expressed in different fora when he said the best the U.S. can contribute to stabilize the world economy today is to have a strong U.S. economy. And I I I, I certainly share share that point of view. But, but still, there is the issue of being mindful 
of the spillover effects on emerging markets. Because then, if you have a crisis, as you said, in emerging markets, you can have spillbacks, and then uh, the, the, the issue of uh, converging into a better state in the world economy uh, becomes more, more complicated. I will f finish with the issue that for monetary policy to work, uh, it's very important that it becomes credible. And for it to be co become credible, it really has to have a well-defined mandate, well-defined uh, use of instruments, and show to the public at large that it can deliver what is supposed to deliver. Uh, and I think that the fact that the uh, it's very vague now in, in many latitudes what the mandate of the central bank really is. And that's why I think that some of the credibility on the central banks and the public support of the central banks have been eroded. So I think that's a, also a, a basic that I think that we have to return to. So I'll stop here, Jens. Thank Thanks you very much. And I pass right to Francois, please. Does it work? Yes. Thank you, Jens. Uh, thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, you reminded us about the famous image of the central banker who is the one who takes away the punch ball before the party ends. Uh, I would like to propose today a still more accurate image, especially in Europe, where soccer or football, as we say, is a very popular game. I don't know if you are conscious that, especially today, central bankers are the one who take away the real ball before the party ends. Or to be still more precise, today afternoon before the party starts, because you are not conscious probably that Jacob, that just as we are speaking, the famous <coughs> game between France and Ireland is taking place. <laughs> and so see it as a great sign of friendship. <laughs> And there's a great commitment for all of us as central bankers to spend these hours with great pleasure, I must say, with you, but instead, instead of following the real ball uh, in France, Ireland. Uh, we will see at the end of the lecture where we are in, 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 the, in the soccer game. I, I hope we'll have good news. Um, so you used, uh, how much is it? One zero. One zero four. Uh, no good news. <laughs> you get five minutes on top to consolidate. Okay. <laughs> no, we will. I, I intended to do some remarks on unconventional monetary policy, but we, we will need unconventional soccer game. Uh, so, uh, and you use the image of an orchestra. Uh, can I say to you personally that uh, you are somebody like a one-man band uh, because you have played all instruments pertaining to academia, central banking, the private sector, and most importantly, wisdom, which is probably the virtue central bankers need most in this delicate period. Uh, now, discussing your lecture is a bit like waiting for the London bus you mentioned because I can say it also for Agustin and Raghu, we didn't know exactly what would be your lecture. <laughs> so you know that the bus will come. <laughs> it's more, Jacob's lecture is more pleasant than the next crisis, to, but to be fair, but you don't know exactly when and where it will come from. Uh, so in this case, you have to prepare, and I prepared some slides anyway, and then to adapt. Uh, to adapt, I will make some brief comments on Brexit, because you alluded to it, and as I am the European discussant, and then concentrate my remarks on two uh, topics you mentioned, unconventional monetary policy and uh, the rest of the orchestra, and the question of the musicians' strikes. Uh, first on Brexit, we probably all here regret this decision, and I have a special and friendly food for our British colleagues, uh, but we do all have to accept and respect it. Uh, the priority for us as monetary authorities is now to reduce uncertainty and to foster confidence. For us as central bankers, it takes at least two phases. First, 
managing the financial shock and central bank cooperation has been effective last Friday, but together we must remain mobilized and determined, and be sure we are. And second, preserving the smooth functioning of our strong European assets. And Jens would say it probably with exactly the same word. May I remind you for the non-European colleagues uh, of an important political fact. The euro is supported by more than two thirds of the euro citizens, 68% precisely in the list Eurobarometer, and this popular support has been steady through the European crisis. That said, I come to unconventional uh, monetary policy. Uh, and you said we need it, and you also said it raises questions. Uh, let me stress that it has been effective, even if it has played, and a bit too much, in the same way as a solo performance of music. I will recall uh, a couple of simple pieces of evidence and some academic results before addressing one relevant example of concern. The most basic evidence of the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy has been its contribution to avoiding a repetition of the Great Depression. The second piece of evidence is the fact that the US, which was the first to make massive use of unconventional monetary policy, is now the first in the process of exiting the crisis. The euro area became the epicenter several years after the US. It launched then, at a later date, a similar QE program. Thus, the US has effectively shown the way, as illustrated by correlated developments in the ratio of central bank's assets, this is the full line over GDP and US core inflation dotted line, which is now around 2%. Obviously, we in the euro area are not at the same point of the business cycle, but we are traveling along the same road for monetary policy. True, some academic quarters worry that the interest rate channel may be more effective at taming inflation than at reviving it. This is a famous string versus toothpaste debate. They see monetary policy as putting on a string at the effective lower bound, which is slightly lower than the zero lower bound, Yet, many papers, and I will not comment on all of them mentioned on this slide, do not support this image and this asymmetry of the effects of monetary policy. In fact, tools may have changed at the ELB, but for instance, forward guidance of lower rates for longer has flattened the old yield curve. Thus, neither the magnitude nor the legs of monetary channels seem to have been substantially affected according to research based either on recent work by the Banque de France and the Eurosystem or an in-house literature survey on quantitative measures. Therefore, and you see it on the slide, in large economies, monetary policy measures still take at least around two years to have a maximum impact on inflation and four years on the price level. As lags may be on the longer side in the euro area, where market remains less flexible than in the US, patience, and you said it, is required to fully assess the impact of ECB measures recently implemented or announced. You also mentioned the importance of financial stability of spillovers. Be assured we take them into account. I now come to the other players of the orchestra, and this is a very important question Augustine alluded to too. Uh, we all agree that monetary policy alone cannot boost potential GDP. The need for growth-friendly public finances, and structural reforms has been stressed for a long time, 
and Augustine just alluded to uh, really the requirement for an adequate and comprehensive policy mix, including prudential. Let me suggest how the orchestra could play before giving an example of what to play. Uh, how to play. Strong policies require strong institutions. And better integrated policies also require stronger international or regional institutions. At the G20 level, a permanent secretariat involving possibly the IMF would help. At the euro area level, I have, along with others, called for a finance minister to fully coordinate fiscal policies and structural reforms. And let me say, this is not a question about more Brussels. This is a very concrete question about more growth and employment in Europe. So that the decision to achieve this is obviously a matter for governments. But let me stress the obvious link between two assessments we probably all share. First, monetary policy cannot be the only game in town. Second, monetary union is still partly missing the economic union. Now, a good example of what the orchestra should play beyond restoring confidence is the need to support investment. Uh, here, this is a chart about the ratio of investment to GDP in advanced economy. It suggests, in addition to the savings glut inherited from the 2000s, something like an investment strike as a legacy of the global financial crisis. And this investment strike also applies to the euro area. There is an abundance of savings, but a lack of appropriate investment financing. As argued with Jens in our joint February article, a financing and investment union should bring together the capital market union, the banking unions, and the Juncker plan, as well as promote more equity financing, especially more cross-border equity financing, so private risk sharing. Here again, structural reforms are needed, and we all agree about that. But some economic paradox remain to be explained. To rebalance growth and spur private investment, we need to understand, for instance, why the expected cost of equity for firms has apparently not dropped as much as the level of the risk-free interest rate and as much as the cost of financing investment. This seems the case in Germany, as you see, in the US as well, and this is my last slide, the estimated expected cost of equity, the black line, is stable and many firms apparently prefer to buy back their shares or distribute dividends rather than to invest. <coughs> and this debate is growing in the US about so-called short-termism. To conclude, monetary policy and central banks are interdependent with other policies and institutions, even if they remain independent of curse. And I heard, Jacob, your wording about autonomy. To show that we central banks are right to worry that we are the only game in town, may I quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was not a central banker, but he said, how could you have a soccer team if all were goalkeepers? How could it be an orchestra if all were French horns? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, Ragu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that was a, a wide-ranging, fascinating talk by Jacob, um, and uh, clearly uh, not giving us the talk beforehand. He was testing our ability to think on the fly and to respond. Uh, so I, I was uh, trying to think, uh, and uh, here's a set of random thoughts, but uh, in reaction to 
I think what is the, the question at the heart of his talk, which is, why is populism popular? In other words, he's making a desperate plea for orthodoxy and saying, let's not abandon orthodox principles. And I guess the converse of that is, is, is um, populism has become uh, popular. Um, and, I, and I think the, uh, if you want to uh, talk about the uh, institutional and environmental situation which supported the orthodoxy, the 80s and the 90s, uh, one would guess uh, that it was in um, societies where elites were respected, uh, where there was a feeling that they could understand and interpret for the masses policies, uh, that it was broadly a positive sum game. Again, I, I don't want to push these things too far, but broadly a positive sum game. And actions weren't interpreted as favoring one constituency versus another. It, there was a sense of coherence in society, a little more than, than today. Um, what happens if there is no trust uh, in the elite, no common economic paradigm, there are lots of competing paradigms, uh, some of which contradict the laws of economics, and very little trust in institutions? Well, that's what we call an emerging market, right? That uh, it's, it's the kind of environment that we have worked in in the past, and we've tried to change that uh, to try and say that, yes, there are some broad principles. Yes, there are institutions that we should build. Uh, and yes, that uh, you know, some people uh, uh, can be trusted. The experts can be trusted. And it takes time to do that. But my sense is what the, uh, what the crisis has done is in industrial countries created the kind of conditions that bring you back to the conditions that we experience in emerging markets. And uh, you know, again, back to an entirely new situation uh, where policies don't seem to work as advertised, where therefore one can argue the normal laws of economics don't apply. Uh, where the elite who were pushing these policies before have lost reputation. There's a sense that they don't know, so uh, they couldn't be trusted leading us before. So how can they be trusted now? Uh, there's a zero-sum game. If uh, that immigrant comes in, he takes my pension away. Uh, and if I, if I, if I give uh, to this set, whether it's the top 1% or somebody else, I lose out in the longer run. And therefore, things have become very much more complicated. The ability to get coherent economic policy in this environment is more limited, which is what we have been experiencing for so many years in, in the past. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think it, it creates an entirely new environment for central banks. And I think we've been, we've been seeing a little bit of this. Uh, I mean, there's always the, the notion that uh, many of us have ex expressed that you know, it can only be part of the solution that others have to step up to the plate. But what if others are paralyzed, cannot step up because the environment has, has changed tremendously? Uh, how much do you do? And I think this is where Jacob's angst comes through, I think. Uh, if I interpret what you're saying, uh, you should have gone to a point and then can take a little bit of a detour, but you should always come back that these detours which seem longer term and long lasting uh, may be problematic in the longer run. At least that's what I, I, I hear you saying. But the, the, there, are, there, there are two issues here. One, the hope, belief in central banks that somebody else will step up to the plate not being fulfilled. And second, something we're responsible for uh, ourselves as a central banking community, the statement that we can do it just wait, we have one more tool up our sleeve. We aren't exhausted yet. There's always a bazooka left that we haven't used. Well, if, you, if we say that, and at the same time nothing else is, is coming to the plate, then effectively, uh, as, uh, as uh, Francois said, we, we, we become the, the only game in town. And how to, how to uh, um, move away from that is, is, is really, really quite difficult. So stepping back to uh, what policies do you follow in such an environment which is entirely new? 
uh, and where there's tremendous uh, political suspicion of the elites, of elite institutions, uh, and a sense that uh, you know you really don't care for the masses. You're you're bought and paid for uh, by Wall Street or its equivalent in every country. Um, well, one thing is to damn the torpedoes. Uh, uh, I think of, of if you if we were crudely orthodox, you would say damn the torpedoes. I do so much and no more, and then let the pieces fall where they will. This is how much I can do. My sense is, uh, while that would be nice uh, from an orthodox perspective, it's it's not going to be feasible in the kind of environment we are in. So next is to say, well, you know, let's let me try innovating, and you come up with new solutions, and some of them work a little bit, uh, but not enough. And and they haven't. And, and then the question is, what more do you do? And uh, at some point, do you call stop, or do you keep holding out the promise? Of, of, uh, of something more. And I think as you go down the list of instruments that you pull out, the ratio of economics to politics uh, keeps falling, that ultimately you're doing it because it won't let you stop. You, I mean, the system won't let you stop. Um, so my sense is this is the reason why we are in this in this in this dilemma. The the environment has uh, has changed a lot. Not the economic environment. The laws of economics broadly apply. Of course, the economic environment has changed a little bit because of the uh, the zero lower, lower bound conditions we are in, or maybe changed a lot. But it's also the political environment has changed, and the respect uh, for elites who who focus on on the economics and not on, on, a, on a broader segment of the population, uh, at least that's the, the popular view, uh, becomes, becomes very hard. Now, let me switch to emerging markets in this kind of situation, and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, um, we talked a little bit about spillovers. Uh, well, uh, thinking about spillovers becomes much more difficult in this kind of environment, even if you wanted to, uh, simply because uh, the whole pressure is on focusing on the domestic economy and doing whatever you can, whatever it takes, to uh, to bring it back, and and uh, that also, to my mind, I think uh, Jacob alluded to this. Didn't go full hog down, uh, full full way down this. That what is the exit out of this kind of environment? And exit becomes very very much harder when you're focused uh, uh, domestically, uh, especially when a important channel. Uh, of transmission is the exchange rate because the first one to exit gets the full brunt and uh, uh, of the exchange rate appreciation uh, becomes more difficult to go out. You need some sort of, I don't know what the right word is, coordination, cooperation for everybody to slowly move out, but uh, I'm not sure we, we have the uh, kinds of frameworks to do that right now. The second uh, spillover is is more a um, it, a um, idea spillover, which is just as emerging markets started adopting the orthodoxies which were lauded earlier, which helped us survive some of the uh, uh, more dramatic effects of the of the crisis. Uh, industrial countries have started debating all the orthodoxy. So, used to be uh, that uh, you know, um, um, for example. Uh, you know, the IMF was all about fiscal consolidation and, and fiscal rectitude. Well, even that last bastion has given way. So for us in emerging markets to think, to talk about fiscal rectitude becomes very hard because immediately they point to the IMF and say, even the IMF doesn't talk about fiscal rectitude. So uh, there is a sense that you get in emerging markets that maybe even economic theories have pro-cyclicality. Uh, and uh, to some extent, it's not so much the pro-cyclicality in emerging markets, but in industrial countries, and it spills over. So in a sense, if you take uh, Jacob's advice to us, I think it's the right one. If you are an emerging market, a small boat in the turbulent oceans of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, policy and environment uh, emerging from elsewhere, uh, what do you do? Uh, you want us to be more orthodox, but you want us to be more orthodox in an environment where orthodoxy is being thrown out of the window. So it does become 
uh, a lot more difficult to talk about labor market flexibility, low fiscal deficits, low inflation, uh, all those good things uh, in an environment where, uh, where the sort of, uh, let me put it this way, uh, industrial countries had the, um, had the benefit of, of being where they were, of, of showing the way to prosperity and growth. And that's why even though all emerging markets had the debate of how we are unique and the laws of economics don't apply here, sneaking suspicion was there is a path and let us try and pick up that path and follow, bring down inflation, bring down fiscal deficits and that, that glorious day when we ourselves will become moderately rich will be there. But, uh, but now we have two strikes against that path. One is that there was a big crisis, and how much was that path responsible for the crisis? So was inflation targeting the reason why we had this massive crisis? I, that debate is going on. Uh, and second, uh, that industrial countries themselves are, are uh, sort of re de are debating the orthodoxy, uh, which then means that even they don't believe in it. So therefore, what do we do? So um, for somebody who believes entirely in what, uh, what Jacob's uh, been talking about, uh, life is very difficult in an emerging market.